you already know what it is. Jay Williams, let's live life. And we're back. Do I got a story for y'all today? I've also got somebody coming on soon that I've been talking about. I talked to the other night. He wants to come on. Homeboy, my name TJ. Talked about TJ in the last video. I think TJ's doing 32. He just caught a fresh 32 for for two hats. If you don't know what a hat is, ask somebody. But he got two hats under his belt. So uh, we going for a while. Be lucky to become a home. Period. But we got to chopping up. We got to talking, and he was up Greensville, and I was up Greensville, and we know all the same people. That's just is what it is. If you were anybody that was doing anything, that was in the mix of anything. We dealt with people. But we got to talk about Radar, man. He knows a lot about Radar just like I do. So we went back and forth laughing about Radar. There was so much that went on with Radar with him chasing the boys all day that I don't want to say it was comical, but it was comical at times. Until things would get serious. Radar is one of the dudes that he didn't just, you know, no means no. But to Radar, no means they're playing hard to get. And Radar didn't really listen. So he would push it to the limit until it came to, you know, the boop, bop, boop, bop. Or somebody with a weapon, like... He just didn't know when to stop. He was going to go all out in the name of love. But then we got to talk about some other people. Now, you got to think, I left there in 2012. TJ would remain there several years after I was gone. So I got to get filled in on some other things that took place after I left. One of those things being Solo. Who is Solo? Solo is a black guy doing a life sentence. Not a small guy, but not the biggest guy in the world, but bigger than average. There's a guy that helped open Greensville when the place opened in 1992. Now, you got to think, when I left in 2012, Solo was still there. So that's 20 plus years that man has been at Greensville. He's like a staple there. Like, there's no possible way that he's going anywhere. These people love Solo. With his maintenance gig, this man started working on things as soon as they were installed. He helped install things. That's just what Solo did. So he was an asset to the prison. Solo would get into, you know what? We're not going to drag it out. I'm not going to tell you too much about Solo. We'll do that in the video. Stay tuned. With all that being said, you know how to see it. You know how to live it. So, let's relive it. Gainesville Correctional Center. It's like a place most people have never been. This place is the largest penitentiary in the state of Virginia. Opened in 1992 after millions upon millions upon millions of dollars were spent. It was supposed to be their solution to overcrowding and violent inmates started off as a max and then they came along with other prisons red onion the super maxes they were level sixes at one point now it's just level fives fours threes twos and ones greensville now is a three but also houses four inmates i've talked to a lot of guys that helped open greensville let me tell you what helped open greensville means Greensville is a compound that holds over 3,000 inmates located in Jarrett, Virginia, Emporia, to be exact. And right out the gate, with it being a new prison, what do they have to do? They have to put people in the bunk. And a lot of guys that help open it, meaning they were in the first group of guys that came into Greensville. Solo was in the first group of guys that came into Greensville. When they were backing buses up and starting to put guys in themselves for the first time, Solo was one of them guys. Talking to him and other guys, Silver Chain, just... You know, two cool, different guys. They all told me one thing. They said, this place ain't nothing like what it used to be. Is it violent? Yes. Does stuff still go down all the time? Yes. But when they first opened that place, they called it Murderville. Because, well, so many people were losing their lives up there. Now, people lost their lives when I was there. But not at the rate that they did back in 92, 93, 94, and 96. We were the murder capital of the United States. Google it. At least Richmond was, but Virginia was on the map for the crazy amount of bodies that were popping up. So a lot of guys are going to prison forever. A lot of guys got laced up and put in that chair, got sent to the upper room. Solo would tell me stories about when Greensville first opened, how he first got there. Now, Solo's not your average convict. Solo is one of them dudes that tries to keep a an outstanding rapport with the guards, thinks all the guards like him. And I told you on the beginning of the video, the guards love Solo, but here's the thing. Them guards come and go. New guards arrive all the time. And when new guards arriving, the guards that cared about you, that used to like you, that know you like that, they leave. <laughs> they disappear. Yeah, so these new guards don't know you've been there 20 years. They don't know your rapport. They don't know how long you've been there, and they don't care. 
They come in with a job to do and you just like everybody else. This is your first day because it's his first day. But Solo would tell me, he said, when I first got here, you would get anything you wanted. He said, if you was coming from another prison, your people on the streets pack a box and hide things all inside of this, hide things all inside of that, and mail it like it was getting mailed from the other prison to the prison you just showed up to because your property shows up afterwards. He said, just like that, you had the best of everything. You get a color TV, you get a big fan when they only had the little small cool operator juniors. And then with getting those type of things, you get much, much more. People was getting, you know, every type of narcotic. Dudes was getting money. Like everything you could think of back then was coming in. And they have thousands upon thousands of inmates they're processing daily. Just before all the big scanners were available and the x-ray machines. So a lot of that stuff was getting through, which caused a high influx of violence. Like I said, Solo wasn't your average inmate when it came to the things he wanted. Most guys, if they get on with a guard, oh, they're going to try their hand. They'll start off small with something like, hey, man, bring me a little bit of tobacco. And they're going to work their way up. They're going to test the waters with this guard until they got that guard committing all types of felonies and bringing in everything from, from that white girl, Christina Aguilera, to Bobby Brown. They're going to work their way into making some money. Solo wasn't one of them dudes, and Solo had a rapport with many of the guards in there that had been there for a minute. And the first time I met Solo, Solo lived in S1, I lived in S3. With having that many inmates, you can't just throw them on one yard, that's crazy. So they split it up into three different clusters. It used to be A, B, and C. There's over a thousand inmates in each cluster, three buildings. And then you got one through three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then 10 building, which is the whole. I'm over in seven building. He's in one. We are separated by a whole ton of fences. But the one thing that brings us together is the maintenance gear. I got real good with maintenance. No lie. I got good with mechanics, electrical, plumbing, these doors on a gear system, lemon switches. Like, a lot goes on with it. And the only other person prior to me that I knew that could do what I could do was Silver Chain. And Silver Chain went home. And when he did, I kind of took over like the position as one of the lead maintenance workers where I was at. Well, we get into a situation where they need way more than just me. I'm one man. I can't do it all. They said, let's go get Solo. So we take a trip over to S1. One of the first times I've been on that side of the compound. Also, that's one of the times I realized how big Greensville was. I ran into somebody over at S1 that I knew from the streets that had been there four years. Four whole years. And I had never, ever had no inclination this man was even there. I go with my boss, we meet with Solo's boss, we go to Solo's cell, and the first thing I notice is there's a main table bolted to the wall, and there's a little table where we put cosmetics. That whole top shelf is full of different sunglasses and full of different watches. I'm not talking Ray-Bans, I'm not talking cheap gas station glasses, no. I'm talking glasses that cost money. Gucci's, Versace glasses, like, yo, what is you doing? How did you get these? doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure it out only one or two ways you've been down long enough that anytime a nice pair of glasses comes across you snatch them up off an inmate you buy them or you take them however you get them or you got somebody from the streets bringing you stuff in now next to these glasses were these watches now you're talking everything at the time the g-shocks were popping especially the white ones and the gold ones and the white and black ones and the camos like you had a bunch of different g-shocks but this man also had gold watches i'm talking watches with diamonds in them Gold and silver watches. Like, he had to have 10 watches laying up there with another 10 pair of glasses beside it. That was his drop. That's what he wanted from the offices. You want something from me? I want something from you. You can wear a watch and you can wear glasses and just make sure I get them glasses and that watch when you come on shift. My first encounter with Solo was beyond crazy. His boss goes to the door and starts talking, and I don't hear no response back. And he looks at us and he goes, hold on. And he's talking to Solo and you hear no talking back, and he looks at us and goes, hold on. And I'm standing there and I'm waiting to hear a response. Like, dude say, all right, I'm coming. Let me do my boots on. Let me change my pants. Something. And I don't hear nothing. I kind of hear rustling. And then he goes, the boss leans forward. And he's looking at something. He comes back. He says, all right, he's getting ready. I said, man, does he do sign language? Like, what do you mean he's getting ready? I didn't hear him say nothing. He comes out the sun. He's got a pad of paper and a pen in his hand. And he shoves it in his back pocket. I tell him, I said, what's up, man? I'm Jay. And he says, he kind of nods his head. So as I'm walking with him and the two bosses, we're headed back to S3. Do a little small talk, trying to get a feel for who this dude is. Is he a weirdo? Is he somebody to watch out for? Is he a bandit? Like, what's up with dude? So I start just chit-chatting, a little talk, right? Nothing too crazy. At which point he nods his head and points to a wristband on his wrist. And the wristband says, I've taken a 30-day 
vow of silence. I will not speak until it had a date written down. And I looked. Now, I had seen this before. I seen a dude in the jail do it, and he said he did it to enlighten himself, to better figure out who he was around. He said you could learn a lot from just listening. So I said, okay, you're one of those dudes. I thought he was weird. No lie. So this dude was all the way shot out. We get over to the building. Now, we've got a whole lot going on with the plumbing system over there. There are closets in between every single cell, and something has been flushed, and there's literally hundreds of pipes, and whatever's been flushed can be lodged in any one of these pipes. This man is a master at figuring out which pipe it is that is clogged in. I learned a lot from him. So the boss sends him up in the closet. He goes up in the first closet, pulls out the pen and pad, writes something down, shows it to him. All right, they shut that door, we go to the next one. I'm watching, I'm taking it in, I'm trying to learn. I like to learn, I learn fast. Go to the next closet, he writes something down. My boss tells him, man, you need to speak. Like, you just keep writing on that pen and pad, like, just say what's going on. The solo writes, Fuck you. Damn, it's like that. And everybody starts laughing. He writes it again with a bunch of exclamation points. Fuck you. All right, you got it, man. Now, Solo's not a dude to be messed with. Before I met Solo, I had heard about Solo. Solo had made a name for himself. Not no slouch will give you the business if that's what you're looking for. But for the most part, he tried to stay out the way. He wanted to stay in the good graces of them guards. He wanted them watches. He wanted them sunglasses. And I can pretty much guarantee that at some point or another, he might have got funky with something else they might have brought in. But to my acknowledgement, the only thing he ever cared about was some watches and sunglasses. For a lot of inmates, having things like that make you feel somewhat normal. Makes you feel somewhat like you're back on the streets. I would work with Solo time and time again. Right? Like this man could match anything I did in the same speed I did. And we just worked well together. By now, his vow of silence is over. So he's talking and he's getting into how he's been there all these years. And we're talking about different people we both know and kind of build a rapport. Now, dude, like I said, is no slouch. He's not nobody you want to beef with because he's going to dig up in your mouth. He's had more fights in the 20 plus years he's been down than most people will in their entire life. 20 plus years in prison as an alpha male, as an aggressor, is going to come with a whole lot of blood, sweat, and tears. And not always yours. Solo would tell me little stories about this guard and that guard. And I don't want to get too much into it because the man's still locked up. But everything I'm going to say is common knowledge. All this stuff has come out since then. And he would just share things with me that had happened in his time. Cellmates he had beat up, dudes he had attacked for this reason or that reason. So I do. A lot of guys didn't like Solo. They thought he was weird because he kept taking the vows of silence. He would do one, come off, and two weeks later go back on it. Sometimes 30 days, sometimes 60 days, sometimes 90 days. When I left, Solo had went back to one building, was back across the yard. Every now and then I would go over one building or S1, and we'd have to do some stuff, and I'd see Solo, we'd kick it and talk and laugh and just build like we did when he was over in S3. But it would be short-lived. To say the least, Solo was I with me, and I never had no issues with Solo, right? Even though a lot of men did. Fast forward, I leave. Now, this story I'm about to tell y'all, I've heard from more than one person, from quite a few people. Solo, as I told you, was one of them dudes that thought all the guards liked him, all the guards loved him. Like, he was going, he went a little too far with being friendly with the guards at times. A little too far. A little too ha-ha, a little too kiki, a little too just talkative when it came to the guards. And to a lot of convicts, that's going to raise an eyebrow, but they didn't really think much about it because it's Solo. They know Solo ain't police. Most of these convicts been down with Solo most of the time he's been down and they know what he's about. He ain't about to rat on nobody. He ain't about to tell on nobody. Nah, he lets them do their job. He's not going to do their job for them. But he did chit-chat with them because, well, I guess they worked at the prison. They were part of the prison just as much as Solo was. Solo had a thing for the female guards, but he wasn't a gunner. He wasn't <laughs> hiding in the shadows, whacking. Nah, he wasn't doing none of that. But he would entertain himself by talking, flirting. Man, if I ever make parole, we gonna get up. He would do all that with these females. And he was known to frequently chop it up with the female guards. Even some of the male guards. But they're the ones I think he was trying to get things from as far as the little things he wanted. They were, he was using them to accommodate the little things he needed. So I'm talking to TJ. TJ would go on to tell me the same story that at least five other people have told me. Pretty much verbatim, word for word. Not much has changed in the story I was told. He gets to ask me, like, you remember Solo? I see that was my dog, man. Solo, they used to take the vow of silence, never be talking, writing on the pen and pad. Like, dude thought it was weird, had all the glasses and the watches, Benny Greens, or forever. Yeah, that's Solo. I said, what's up? He said, you ain't heard what happened. I said, yeah, I heard what happened. A bunch of people told me what happened. You tell me what happened. 
He said, man, you know, solo like them females. Always looking for a way to get close to one. Show you right. I know that. Who don't know that about solo? Just shooting a shot, but not going too far the way he can get himself jammed up or locked up. He said, yeah, man. A solo ran up on a situation and tried to play Captain Saber Hole. Now, there are some things that are just morally correct. Some things you should do as a man. Some things you're almost obligated to do as a man. Especially when it comes to them weirdo dudes in there that'll try to take things too far, that'll definitely try to take something. Now, you gotta remember now, you don't always know who these men are. But there's telltale signs on who the offenders are, on who the pissed are. They'll stand on the top tier when a woman comes in and lock in on her like she's an alien. They'll stare at this woman like they ain't never seen a woman a day in their life. To the point that when you catch them, it's uncomfortable. You see him doing it, you're like, oh man, what's up with this dude, man? This guy, like, man, watch him. Hide the women. Lock them up. Get them out of here. Like, this dude is salivating at the mouth like a wolf. Like, watch him. But I do believe a lot of them would have bad charges if the opportunity presented itself. And that's what happened with this situation. That boy driving a Camaro on 30s. That's crazy. Solo's doing what Solo does, comes back from work one day. A lot of guys have locked in. A lot of guys are going for childs around that time. 4.35 o'clock-ish is when we eat. Another dude in there. A guard comes in. And inside the pub, we got a community bathroom. There's a closet right there where the cleaning supplies are. You got brooms, mops, mop ringers. Everything you need to clean up the day room and clean up yourselves is locked inside that closet. Because you don't just want inmates running around with big brooms and big mops and mop ringers. Because... Gonna turn into gladiator real quick. So the guards will make sure all that stuff was put back, accounted for, the numbers are on the wall, the brooms are numbered, the mops are numbered, and on and on. Solo has come back from work, says he's going to the shower, walks by the area, and as he's walking by, he sees a guard in there and another inmate rush into that mop closet. This inmate then proceeds to attack this female guard. Tries to pull the door closed behind him like nobody can see what's going on. Solo walking, you gotta walk past this to get to the shower. Solo hears the scuffling. Solo hears the cries for help. Hey, this woman is in there, DOC employee, doing her job. Here you have this, this inmate trying to violate, trying to do the unthinkable, trying to do the worst. Not only is he attacking the woman physically, but he's trying to take her innocence. This woman comes here to work a job and the unthinkable is taking place. She's got one of these weirdos, one of these fenders up in the closet with her, attacking her, putting hands on her, attempting to pull her clothes off. She can't get to her ready. And the man is on top of her, much bigger man than she was. Solo hears it. Now, general rule is you don't get involved with what the next man is going on. We're gonna throw that out the window. When it comes to a female, think of that as your mother. That could be your sister. Who cares? She could have made your life miserable. She could bother you every single day, but the right thing to do is to jump in that is a woman. Solo does exactly that. Drops his shower stuff, runs up in that closet, and gets to fighting with this dude. Well, on the time that he gets to fight with this dude, the woman is now set free. She's under the impression she's now being attacked by two inmates. She gets to fighting back, makes her way up out the closet, locks these two dudes in the closet. So Solo's now in there with the offender, rumbling, getting it in. She runs the control booth and says, I was just attacked by two inmates. They call the goon squad, the goon squad comes in there, pops the door open, there's Solo, there's dude, dude's leaking, Solo's leaking, they spray him down, drag them both out, cuff him up. Solo's a convict. He's not gonna say what happened. It's the rules, you can't say what happened. Even though that dude is a whole entire weirdo, a sicko messed up in the head, you cannot say what happened. Solo will go back to court and be sentenced for everything that that man attempted to do. And I've already told y'all what he attempted to do. So you got the assault. You got the violation that took that attempted to take place. Solo caught all those charges right along with that man that was attempting to do that. And all Solo was doing was attempting to protect that woman. Solo went to the higher-ups, talked to the guards, and said, hey, man, I can't really say what was going on, but I'm here to tell y'all that ain't what I was doing. Y'all charged me with some charges that I didn't do. Like, I ain't even on that type of time. Y'all know me. You'll have your day in court. But you know me. You've been around me for all these years, Sarge. Come on, Lieutenant, man. You can't hit me like that. Like, you know I'm not that type of dude. Come on, man. Don't do that. You already know what it is. If you'll testify to what happened in that, I mean, I can't do that. I got a life sentence, dude. I can't walk around. I got to testify to another inmate. Even if that inmate is a weirdo. 
was attempting to violate a woman. The rules are the rules. The rules don't break or bend for nobody. Solo is no longer at Greensville. Solo has since been shipped up to a higher level in the mountains and is treated as if he did exactly what that guy did. He's now got those charges on his jacket. And you fast forward 10, 15 years to the new blood, to the dudes coming in that don't know so low. What you think they're going to think? When they find out he's got those weird charges. When they find out that the story that really happened has done faded away. It's been exaggerated. It's been twisted to fit the narrative. Now everybody thinks that he's missed a touch a lot. He's the guy that likes to violate. Oh, you did what to a woman in the closet? And you got to think these men ain't getting no younger. 20 years now, Solo being his 60s, 70s, who knows, maybe even his, his late 70s, early 80s. He wasn't no spring chicken when I met him. And doing what was right, he caught the consequences as if he had done everything wrong. I haven't talked to him, but I'm sure if I was to talk to Solo, being the kind of guy that he is, I don't see him having any regrets. Because what he did that day saved that woman. And then what did she do? She turned around and fed him to the wolves. Do I blame her? I don't know. I think sometimes you got to use common sense, but I can see where somebody would be so scared in a moment like that when a second man comes into the play that you just want to get up out of there and then you don't know what's going on. She didn't really know what was going on. There were other inmates that did stay behind in their cells, other inmates in the shower that heard the whole thing that do know what was going on. And they knew that Solo wasn't that type of inmate and then he tried to save that woman. Now, I will say this. I've never heard a story even remotely close to Solo's story. Solo did what I think any man would do. It's what you have to do. Doesn't matter what the inmates think at that point or what anybody thinks at that point. That's when just being a man comes back to you. When the convict leaves you and everything you've learned about prison goes out the window, you've got to do what you've got to do. It's just sad it ended the way it ended. Solo wasn't no bad dude. Now, I'm not... 100% confident on, on saying what Solo's charges were to put him in prison. But based off the way he carried himself and the amount of time he got, I'm going to go ahead and say that Solo had a hat as well. So if you didn't know what hats mean by now, then you should. That means you done took somebody's top off. Like, you got a hat. Salute to Solo, man. Not for anything other than what he attempted to do and what he stopped from happening. The sad part about it is if he didn't have an elbow already, he didn't have that life sentence already, that situation with the guard probably would have put him close to it. He's not the first and won't be the last person I know that caught a lot more time while in prison. He's just the first, I think, to catch time related to something like that. I know guys that took other guys out, guys that caught robberies, guys that did terrible things while locked up and they caught a lot more time. I know guys that defended themselves ended up catching a lot more time because they had to stick to the code of silence. But with Solo's story, it's just, it's so much different from the other stories I'm used to telling. It's somebody that stepped up to try to be a hero. Somebody that put himself in the line of fire to remove somebody else. And in stepping in the line of fire, he definitely got hit. His mission was to save her. And he did. But in the end, there was nobody there to save Solo. And who knows what the future may hold. I hope y'all enjoyed today's story. Solo, Solo, Solo. <laughs> Man, I had some of watches and that's crazy. All oh, them watches and the nicest. I'm talking sunglasses I can't even find in the store. I probably have to go to some special website to order. These are throwbacks. Man had the biggie Versace's like the round ones. That's crazy. But anyways, these jails, these penitentiaries, these guards, these inmates like Solo are just crazy world inside of an already crazy world we live in. And as always, y'all know what I'm doing. Just trying to keep y'all entertained. Are you not entertained? And like always, this is Jay Williams. Let's live life. And to all my real ones, and there are some real ones watching. Y'all still watching me. Now y'all know how we do. Salute.